Good morning. How is everybody? We've got several out today. I knew they were going to be out. And uh, they told me, something told me Wednesday night they were going to be out. So we got several out. But we're glad that you're here. And glad that you're, hope you had a good week. Yeah, today's Daryl's last Sunday at Green Hill. And several of them. Oh, yeah, it's from a funeral I did recently. <laughs> I could not remember. Uh, I forgot I didn't put that up. Mm, yes. Uh, well, no, actually, things like that go for vacation fun. Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, what, last of September, somewhere in that neighborhood, sometime this year, we're my son called about three weeks ago and said, uh, would you like to go on vacation? Yeah. With us? Do I have to pay for y'all? <laughs> <laughs> no, so uh, so Ethan and Kara and Gracelyn, so our kids, and then her mom and daddy. And we get along super well. They're great folks. And uh, Suzanne and I. We're all going down to the beach together for a week. So, yeah, this will be an experience. But we look forward to it. But anyway, we've got several out. Daryl, like I say, Daryl, uh, it's his last Sunday at Green Hill, and uh, several wanted to go hear him, and we understand that. We're glad that they want to support him. And uh, we've got two or three others that are on vacation. I hope that wasn't my paycheck, Steve. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the funeral I did a couple of weeks ago. I forgot any more of this suit. I, when I felt that, I thought, that's done right. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm heavier on this side this morning. Anyway, Genesis 49 is where we are. We'll see how far we get. So I, I figure at least next week we'll get into Genesis, we'll finish Genesis. And then once we finish Genesis, we're going to uh, do a series of lessons. And I'll probably have typed outlines for you. Uh, it's a topical study on getting the most out of your Bible study. And we'll, we're going to talk about the first lesson is basically, you know, why study the Bible? which you might say, well, that's redundant, but I think we all just need to be reminded why study your Bible. The second one will be um, study methods for the Bible. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about um, the inspiration of the Bible or why the Bible is, the, we believe, the Word of God. We'll, we'll talk about it, but not very long. But we're going to talk about uh, methods of Bible study. We're going to talk then about meditation from the standpoint of you know, Psalm chapter 1, David says that uh, that he begins by talking about that the man of God does not walk in the counsel of ungodly, stand in the way of sinners, but sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law, and in that law does he meditate day and night. We're going to talk about meditating upon the Word of God. And it's not it's a little different than a little video I saw of a little urchin that was sitting there going, eh, it's, that's not the meditation I was, <laughs> yeah, I saw that. That's not, the med, that's not the meditation we're talking about. There are people that do that. But, uh, and then we're going to talk about principles of interpretation. How do you go, how do you look at the Bible and come to understand what it's saying? And that will take us several weeks, not, not that many, three, four, about three probably to look at some principles of interpretation. So that's where we're headed. But we need to finish Genesis 49 first. Or Genesis, excuse me. We're in chapter 49. These are, this is Jacob's last words to his son. And we, I made mention of last week the fact that it's important that we really get our last words in to our kids, to our grandkids. And I remember the last conversation that I had with, with Dad uh, it was it was a joke, really, and uh, that sort of fitting of, of my dad. And unfortunately, some of the last conversations with my mom, mom was already dementia had already set in pretty well. So um, they, you know, we had some conversations before all the dementia set in that are precious to me. 
And like I said, we sometimes we need to sit down and we need to talk about those things. Those things are not always pleasant. They're not always fun, but they're needful. They're helpful. They, they, they sort of bring to a close chapters. And I, I believe in that. I've tried to do that with Ethan as he's progressed in life. I've tried to have short conversations, not long, not hour long. You know, some of them have been two, three minutes. But we've tried to kind of close chapters as we've gone through our relationship. We've gone through life. And, and I don't know about him. Hopefully when he gets to be my age and he looks back, he'll say, well, Dad was not as stupid as I thought he was. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, Jacob, it's almost, I envision it. As he calls them, he says, gather together, verse 1, that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days is that he gathers his boys together. And I'm not so sure that he didn't gather a few more. But it doesn't matter. But he gathers his boys together. And really his last words in many ways are prophetic. Now, some of the some of the the discussion goes back to what they did. And we'll look at a couple of those. But it's almost as if this is what's going to happen to you. And so in many ways, if you will, it it sort of gives us some insight into not only Jacob's character, but also the character of his sons and and what kind of folks they were. And it gives us some insight into the relationship that they had. And it evidently was a a decent relationship because he's able to call them together and they come. (laughs) You know, some families don't have that luxury. They've, there are things, there are wedges in the family, and they've been there for years, and they probably will always be there, sadly, and they need to be removed, but they're not. But uh, this family gathers together, and so as they gather together, verse 2 says, gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to the Israel, your father. And he begins, begins by Reuben. He says, Reuben, you're my firstborn, my might. In the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. So he he really talks about, you know, you you were my my star crowning child, so to speak. You were my beginning. And he he talks about the excellency and dignity of power. But you're unstable as water. You should not excel. You're going to lose your preeminence because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it, and he went up to my couch. Now, we, we read about this when we talked about the 35th chapter. We talked about him going up to, to his father's concubine, uh, to Bilhah, and we'll, we'll not go over that. But he says, because of that, he says, you know, the place, you were my strength, and really you should, you should have everything. You're not going to be anything because you messed up. Let's talk about, for just a second, let's talk about the idea that we can do things and we can be forgiven of them, but there are still, at times, consequences that come along with them. I'll give you kind of a, a, a out there, if you will, and it's not so much out there. Bless you. You really need blessings, so bless you. <laughs> Just kidding. But um, someone might, uh, yes, and you too as well. (laughs) Someone in your family might do something. Let's say, uh, because I've worked with some, some some alcoholics, and they've ruined their life. They've ruined their health by their alcoholism. But yet at the same time, too, while they've ruined their their life, they've ruined their health, they've come to the Lord. They've followed God's will. They have become Christians or they have rededicated their life. Are they forgiven? The answer is yes. But there are still consequences for the actions that they took in their life. And so here it is. Reuben, evidently, he still cares in family. But he says... Uh, you're not going to be what you once were or what you could have even been. And then he says, verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers, instruments of cruelty, or 
in their dwelling place. They killed, you might recall, in chapter 24, they killed Shechem and others after uh, their sister had been had been violated, and we talked about that. So we'll we'll not get into that again. Just ask you to kind of go over that in your mind, or go back to the 34th chapter and read that. But he says that you were, you were cruel folks. And then he says in verse six, let not my soul enter their council, let not my honor be united to their assembly, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Kind of going, your, your folks, your children and all, you, you are going to be scattered. But notice what he says. He says, you've been cruel. Now, you know, we when we talked about it in Genesis, when we talked about... <clears throat> them uh, going back in the 34th chapter and we talked about them killing this one that had violated their sister and we talked about retribution we talked about uh, what they should have done and so like I say we'll not get into that but notice that it seems to say in verse 6 and 7 you had a mean streak about you you had a mean streak that was a mile wide as the old saying goes and you did, and notice what it says in the last part of verse 6. You were self-willed. You weren't operating the way you should have been operating. You weren't operating under the guise of, of following God's will. You hamstrung. You, you, you cut an ox tendon so that it wouldn't run or couldn't run. Uh, sometimes you, you, they would cut them, <clears throat> especially if you go back and read in uh, First Second Kings, First Second Chronicles, you'll find where a lot of times in the midst of war, that's what they would do to their opponents, the animals. They would hamstring them. They would they would cut their tendons. So yes, they could walk, but that was it. Not much at that, and they were limited in their mobility. And so he says, "You're just cruel." But notice that he talks about not just cruel, but verse six. He says, "Anger." They had anger. They had wrath issues. They had issues that needed to be resolved and evidently were not, had not been. And so Jacob says, we're going to scatter you, we're going to divide you amongst Israel. And we know, of course, Levi, the tribe of Levi, they didn't receive a, a land portion, did they? They were. They were the priests and they were uh, in amongst the people, as he says. Verse 8, Judah. Uh, I'll open this up in here just a second. Let's get a couple of the, more of these. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. And so he's predicting the idea of your hand on the neck of your enemies is, is a euphemistic phrase for victory. You're going to win. You're going you're gonna to be able to defeat your enemy. Your father's children shall bow down before you. So there's going to be a certain amount of authority that they're going to have. They're going to be the ones in position. That Judah's going to be the one in, in power. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you've gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? So there's growing strength and courage. Let's keep reading this. He says, verse 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Now, that's interesting. Shiloh. Who do you think Shiloh is? It's not the battlefield in West Tennessee. Shiloh's the Lord. Revelation 5. And so he says, uh, he says, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. So Judah is going to have authority. Judah's going to be in control. Judah's going to be the one that folks are going to listen to. They're going to be the one they're going to follow. And so they're the ones in authority. And then he goes on in uh, verse 11. He talks about binding his donkeys to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. These had to be large vines, the old, old donkey. But he says, uh, and he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. If you're able to wash your clothes in wine, what does that tell you? You got a certain amount of money, right? 
a certain amount of abundance. He says, so you're, you're going to have abundance. You're going to have prosperity. He, he continues that thought, verse 12. He says, his eyes are darker than wine. His teeth are whiter than milk. There's just, there's just prosperity. So you, Judy, you're going to fare well. You're going to do, do all right. You're going to have abundance. That's something somebody would like to say before we move farther. Zebulun, he says in verse 13, shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall adjoin Sidon. You go back, or you go forward, actually, from Genesis. You go into Gen- uh, Joshua. You go about the 19th chapter. You find, with regards to Zebulun, where you find that it's a very commercial, industrious location. It, it's where, as he talks about, it's a haven for ships. There was a lot of commercial activity where Zebulun ended up residing. And it became a trade center for people in later times. And so he says, where you settle, you're going to be commercially, you're going to be all right. Issachar, verse 14, is a strong donkey. I don't know that I ever, I've been compared to a lot of things. Don't know that I ever want to be compared to a mule. Or to a donkey, excuse me. But nevertheless, he says you're strong, physically strong. But there there are some problems here, as we'll see, lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. It seems as if, and we do know a little bit of history with regards to Iskar, that, that he had great physical strength. But... Courage was not what it should be. Physical strength, but he didn't know how to to use it properly. And he says, Dan, verse 16, shall judge his people. So Dan's going to be the judge as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation. Oh, Lord. You get into to the book of Judges, and you get into especially the, um, what is it, 14th, 15th, 16th chapter, Samson. You get into to the book of Judges, you get into that. You find that these were hard-fighting judges. Look what he talks about. He says, a serpent, by the way, a viper by the path. Yesterday, I went for a little walk. And as I did, I, I was walking Beside, on the side of the road, and and uh, where I was at the time, there was the grass had grown up a little bit, and there was a little varmint, and he made me jump. I never saw him, but I saw him, uh, and I think it was probably a little mouse. From but he he was scooting, he was trying to get away. He was as afraid of me as I was of him. But he was he was running to to hide. But if he had been something that was uh, what, what might we say, ambitious, <laughs> maybe just a little bit more active, maybe not scared, he could have come out my way. And if he had been something of a biting nature, bitten me. Now, like I say, I think he was a little mouse, but uh, he might not have been. But notice that he talks about, Jacob talks about day, and he talks about how that he says, you're the viper in the path. You're, you're the snake in the road. We talk about judges, <laughs> talk about lawyers, right? But also remember that the Hebrew word that's translated judge here can have the same connotation as the book of Judges. When we think of a judge, we think of someone that's a lawyer that sits in a room and makes decisions, or a judge that, that sits in a room and makes decisions about the cases that are brought before him. But the word judge, it literally means champion. And so when you go back to the book of Judges, which you, another way of looking at that book is to call it the book of champions. And what you have in the book of Judges is you have seven cycles where Israel, Israel is doing well. And as they do well, it's almost like a clock. As they do well, 
they, they soon get into a life of ease, a life of luxury, and a life that forgets God. And they, they progress to that point where, okay, you know, we have truly forgotten God. Well, then hard times kick in. And as those hard times kick in, they begin to say and begin to wonder, you know, why hasn't God delivered us? Why have we gone from bad times to hard times? We're followers of God. Not really. They've forsaken God during that process. But God has not delivered us. And so they begin to cry out for God, and God sends them a champion. See, we've almost made the full circle of the clock. And God sends them a champion, a judge. Go back and read Judges chapter 2 and Judges chapter 3, and you kind of get the, the sense of what a judge is. It's a champion. There are 15 judges in all in the Bible that God rises up or raises up these people. And as he raises them up, they deliver Israel. They become the champions. Well, maybe he's talking about Dan's going to be a fighting man. He's going to be a champion, but yet he's he's going to be vicious. And then he says of Gad in verse 19, he says, A troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. So there's going to be opposition. There's going to be problems. But yet, he says, eventually you're going to triumph. You're going to come out all right. You're going to win. And then he says, Bread from Asher shall be rich. And he shall yield royal dainties. Where Asher settled, the land is very fertile and very rich. And he gets more. He he reaps more, if you will. He harvests more than the average. And so he tells Asher, he says, look, you're, you're going to be all right. Financially, your folks are going to be fine. Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. He's a talker. You want to find out which of, of Jacob's children, which one was the used car salesman? It was Naphtali. He was the guy that could talk. He could sell insurance to anybody. And so he says, Naphtali is like a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. He waxes eloquently. Joseph is a fruitful bough. Fruitful bough by a well is that branches run over the wall. The archers are, gr- are bitterly grieved him, shoot at him, and hated him. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. For there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Let's just stop right here for a minute. He begins by talking about Joseph being fruitful. Joseph is going to have, as Jacob is telling him, you're going to have an influence. You're going to be able to spread, and you're going to, you're going to influence a lot of people. I kept on my desk for a long time. Suzanne and I, one day, one night, went out to a Chinese restaurant, and fortune cookie. And my fortune cookie one night simply read this. Many people will come from far away to hear you speak. I'm not sure that's much of a fortune. I just, you know, we laughed. I threw it on my plate. And that was sometime around my birthday. So for my birthday, she had fr- she had picked that up when I walked off and she had framed it. And I kept it on my desk for a long time. Uh, you, you take whatever you get and you apply it. And, you know, I, I've thought about that often. People come to hear you speak. You got to say something. You got to say something worthwhile. You got to say the right things according to what God has given you, but you got to say something that's worthwhile. And so uh, he he tells Joseph, he says, "Look, you, your your influence is going to spread. Folks are going to come around, and and they're going to hear you, and they're going to see you." And he begins in verse 23, and he says, "You're going to have opposition." Then he says in verse 25, "By the God of your father, who will help you." And by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb, the blessing of your father have excelled the blessing of my ancestors. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who separates from his brothers. 
So in other words, he saves Joseph for last. He says, or not for last, actually, he talks about Benjamin. But he says, Joseph, you were the one that that were separated. You were the one that we lost time with. You were the one that your brothers really took you away from us and away from me. And that wasn't right, but it never, it, nevertheless, it happened. And he says, I want you to know something. It begins verse 25. And he says, you're protected by God, and you'll be protected by God. You know, you say a lot, and you wonder, well, what would, if it could have been my father, what would he have said about me, and so forth and so on. But you think about what Joseph, he says, God's going to protect you. You're going you're gonna to touch a lot of people. You're going to have a great impact upon a lot of folks. But God's going to protect you. What a great thought. We, as we, we looked at the story of Joseph, we, we found a man that really was protected by God. We talked a little bit about providence of God. We've talked a little bit about the story of forgiveness that we see in Joseph. And we're going to, as we conclude the 50th chapter, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But God blessed Joseph. His life was not always easy, but God took care of him. We need to remi- remember that. We need to remember that, that life's not always easy, but God, God's there. The protection of God. The psalmist talks about, I'll, I'll lift up my eyes into the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He who, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Remember that, Psalm 121. The psalmist talks about God's protection. God's protection for his children. And it's a beautiful psalm. And so it, it reminds us really that we're protected. And we have that protection that as you psalmist once again, Psalm 23, that one we're probably all familiar with. We can even walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and God will be with us. And then he talks about Benjamin. He says, Benjamin's a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he should devour the prey, and at night, he should divide the spoil. Uh, we'll, if you jump into Judges 20, you see this. You see this coming to, to fruition, uh, his people, Benjamin's people. But basically, he says, he, he's, he's going to be out there. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessings. Each one received a different blessing. Each one in many ways was basically told, you're going to reap what you sow. Or you will reap what you've already sown. And... So those are some of the lessons that we get out of them. We get out of the sense of the fact that, okay, you know, we're going to reap what we sow. We need God in our life. Joseph is a good one for that. We, we see the fact that we're going to progress in life. We're going to continue. Life moves on. Life always moves on. It always moves forward. Uh, Jacob is to die, yes. As a matter of fact, 50th chapter, Jacob is dead. The next chapter, Jacob is dead. We see his, really his death in the, the end, the 49th chapter. But we see the, the relationships, what I'm trying to say. We see the relationship in the boys in the 50th chapter after Jacob has died. Our life in many ways goes full circle, but our life goes according to how we live it. The choices that we make. All these boys are different, yet they have something in common. What's that? Same daddy, right? Same father. Different mother, but same father. Children can be different. Uh, I think my sister and I, in many ways, we're a whole lot alike. I don't know how that happened. but <clears throat> So you might want to pray for her husband <laughs> as you pray for Suzanne but uh, I look at my two nieces and they are very different same mom same daddy same grandparents you know raised in the same house same time there's four years difference uh, in them but they're very different they, they are their looks are even very different one of them took after 
our side of the family, and the other one took after the <laughs> Vernon's family, look wise. They're both beautiful. I don't mean that, but um, but they're very different. Their their thinking is different. Their talents are different. They're both very talented. They're both wonderful kids, girls, nieces, but they're different. You can raise the children in the same house and be very different. And and that's evident here. Of course, you might say, well, you know, how much were they up under his roof when they were little? Because there were a lot, and he had a lot of wives. And all of that we don't know. And we, we do know, of course, they were, uh, they didn't have houses like we had. They had tents for the most part. And, and they were travelers, Bedouins, for lack of a better term. And so there was there was a lot of difference in say that day and age and maybe this day and age, but at the same time too it reminds us that we can do the very best we can raising our children, but still our children make the choices that they make. And so as parents and grandparents we have to be mindful of the fact that we're responsible to our children, but we're not responsible for our children. In other words, we're responsible to raise them. We're responsible to show them the way. We're responsible to, like, help them with their faith. But we can't make those decisions for them. They have to make those decisions. They have to to decide what they're going to do, where their faith is, who they trust, how they live their life. But it's up to us to do what we can, and then we ultimately have to turn them over and let them live their life. And that's hard, but that's somewhat what Jacob is doing. He's releasing his boys. Here's what, here's what I believe is going to happen to you. But it, notice that it says he blessed the, each one according to his own blessings. Anything I'd like to say about any of that? It's fun to read, and in many ways, it, it, we didn't see we didn't see all these things in these boys, but we saw a few of those things and know uh, how it comes out as we read the Book of Judges. That it, it uh, kind of encapsulates what we've been studying. But Jacob Jacob passes away. Verse twenty nine, he gives some instructions with regards to his burial. He says, then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave. It is in the field of Ephron, the Hittite, the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron, the Hittite, as possession for a burial place. Now, I want you to, uh, uh, something that I guess I had thought about before, but as I was reading over this and studying it this week, I got to thinking about a cemetery. This is a cemetery. So there was evidently land that was set aside. Now, we do know, of course, we talked about recently about how Jesus was buried and and how that many times tombs were found in rocks and in, in, in uh, hills. But in Old Testament times, we wonder about, well, what did they do? Well, evidently, they did have some cemeteries. Now I'm sure people were probably buried in various places because you didn't you didn't have zoning laws and you didn't have to to keep things you know in certain places and have certain guidelines for them. But Jacob does not want to be buried where in Egypt. <laughs> There's something about it. He just wants to go home. And you know that. In many ways, as I, I thought about this, I, I couldn't help but think about all of us. And have we made preparations for our passing? Boy, that's that's not pleasant to sit down and think about, OK, when I die, this is where I want to be buried. And this is, you know, and, and here are the arrangements. And I've I've talked to talked to counsel a lot of folks. I, I haven't heeded my counsel. I'll tell you that. But at the same time, too, how important that is. It's it's really a blessing 
in many ways, uh, having gone through it both personally and then gone through it with a lot of families, that when you go to the funeral director and the funeral director is able to say, okay, uh, your mother, your father, your grandmother, your grandfather, whatever, came to us back years ago, prepaid for their funeral, so it's all paid for, wrote down everything that they wanted to, you know, how they wanted. They wanted this done, that done, these songs. My aunt, as I've told you before, I had an aunt that was my father's sister. She had no children. Um, her husband had passed away. I was, dad was supposed to take care of her estate. She outlived dad. So I was supposed to, there was really nothing there. But when she passed away, uh, went to, I knew I was supposed to go to Bell's to the, funeral home so i called them up or they had already been contacted because they'd already they were coming to get her her remains i asked them i said when can we meet because i was living in dixon at the time living in middle tennessee and they said well how about in two hours great and so suzanne and i went and the arrangement's real easy mr darty will you just sign here your aunt paid which i knew i knew all this but she prepaid she not only had prepaid for years ago for her funeral, she, of course, had her, her plot was to be buried next to her husband, who had passed away many years before. Uh, here's the instructions as far as this is what she wanted to be buried in, as far as clothes go. Got it. This is, this is uh, where she's to be buried. This is the, the preacher for the Bell's Church of Christ is to do her funeral. That's great. These are the songs she wants. That's fine. And so we we gave her every part of her wish that she wanted. But it was all fixed. It was all fixed. Now, I could have done it, and I could have done it fairly quickly, having gone through it, like I say, with folks. But that's a blessing. That's one decision or a multitude of decisions, really, that you, you don't have to make. And you just, you can go and you can, you know, she, I think, best I recall, Aunt Catherine had even left instructions with regards to, to visitation. And we honored those because, to be honest, it's kind of the way I wanted to do it too, but I had already made up my mind. And so, we, but if you can do that and think about that, that's a good thing to do. Verse 31 says, so there they buried Abraham and Sarah were in this cemetery. His wife, they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife, and there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up to, into the bed, breathed his last, and gathered to his people. It's almost as if, when you read the last part of verse 33, it's almost as if he willed himself to die. I believe you can do that. Mary Kubler Ross, in her book entitled Death and Dying, written many years ago, talked about this idea of willing yourself to die. When you've come to the last part of your life and you realize there's nothing else you can do, and physically you are physically drained, you can will yourself to die. Think about the old Indian. The old Indian, you know, would live his life, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, really, it's somewhat admirable. To it. He'd live his life, he'd do the best, he would tell everybody he was, you know, this is it, and he would go out, off, and he would die. And it just seems as if maybe that's what's happening here. He just pulled his legs up, breathed his last breath, and he'd go. Whether he willed himself to die or whether he just simply put it was the pressure of time. It's always interesting. One of the things that's always almost fascinating, and that's a terrible choice for words, always interesting to me is to, to visit people in the hospital. And for the doctors to know, you know, I've walked in on people, I've walked, I've been called in on people that the doctor will say they're not going to make it through the night. Now, sometimes they miss it. <laughs> sometimes they miss it. Um, I know of a man that uh, 
visited him a couple of times, didn't know him real well. His family, his grandchildren actually came to where I preached, but he, they told him he'd pass away. Well, you know, hospice is two years. You can hospice basically when they put you in hospice care, you're anywhere from like two minutes to two years, and then they kind of drop you. Uh, he outlived hospice by several years, <laughs> and then they put him on hospice again. But it, the second time, uh, he didn't he didn't live through it. But it's always been amazing to me to, like I say, be called in and say, they're not going to live through that. And they don't. And maybe that's the scenario here. He just, he was towards the end. He knew it. Okay, let me talk to my boys. Let me get it all, let me lay it all out. He lays it all out. And then he just passes away. Anything anybody like to say or ask or comment on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is so sad, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't give us his motive. It just, you know, and, and and like I say, the predictions, especially when you get to judges and you find the lands that they settled and their their children, their children's children, you find out these things came true. So, yeah, I don't, the motive, though, is not explained, but it, it when you hear that, it's almost, you're almost defeated and deflated. Yeah. Yeah. Very hard. Very hard. Of course, I knew when my dad said I'd be a millionaire, I thought, not preaching. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. <laughs> he didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 It. Uh, you wonder, and there's no way of knowing, because we don't have motive. If he was hoping that some of this would change some of them. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. 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 All good. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and and it's very, you know, can a zebra change its stripes? I believe they can. I mean, not <laughs> biologically, I know you can. But a person can change. Uh, I've seen it. You've seen it. You may have experienced it. And uh, But yes, you're right. Anything else? Well... Okay, we'll begin reading, but Bell six and ring here in just a minute. It says, Joseph fell on his father's face, wept over him, and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. You had embalming in that day. That's why we have mummies. It's a process that we're going to see. We're going to see here in just the next verse, really. It took 40 days. And so uh, embalming is a, is a choice. Uh, it's not so much so in the state of Tennessee as it is in some other places. Uh, there's a certain amount of care that they have to, to the funeral directors have to take in the, the body. And uh, so they do that. But they did it in, in, in Joseph's day or in Jacob's day. Forty days, let's, we'll read verse three. Forty days were required for him 
such the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourn for 70 days. So probably all told. So 40 days for embalming him, 30 more days they mourn for him. So think about 70 days. Uh, you're talking about two months and 10 days on an average. That's 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 a long time to mourn. Now, exactly, exactly, and, and I don't know, and I've tried to research a little bit and can't really find anything that I just want to hang my hat on. But what all what all it entailed? I mean, they didn't sit around for for 70 days and just say, "Woe is me," and sit and beller and cry. But there was a period of time in which they honored the dead, and it was for 70 days. Anything else? We have to end right there because George is going to ring the next bell. Well, we will finish, Lord willing, we will finish Genesis next week. I want to kind of bring it all full circle after we finish. We'll talk about what's there in the fifth chapter as we talk about Joseph's forgiveness of his uh, brothers. But more importantly, because we kind of already talked about that, I want to talk about the heart of Joseph and and what kind of heart we need. We'll, we'll find out that Joseph really had a, a really good heart. And kind of the heart kind of that we need. We'll talk about that. And I'll say I'll kind of bring Genesis to a close. Anything else? All right. Well, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the blessings of life. And we're thankful for a study of, of Genesis and, and really what Genesis 49 shows us with regards to living our lives and the consequences of our lives. And also how we could could possibly if we would listen and give heed to to the instruction of others that we can even change our lives we ask that you watch over us that you bless us be with those that are sick be with us as we enter into our period of worship we'll worship you in spirit and in truth watch over us bless us and hold us as we hold to you for this is our prayer in christ name amen thank y'all y'all have a great week we'll have our folks back next week